Hey, when you have no air conditioner, you, you cut it off. You got shoulder. <laughs> I was scared. Alright, let's start Bible class here in a minute. I had to change my batteries because I think they died sometime towards the end of worship. So come on and uh, gather up your, your coffee and goodies. Yeah. So we are uh, streaming already, so those of you who are online, welcome. Good to have you with us as we continue our Bible study in the places of faith. Uh, Jesus and the geography of the New Testament, not just the, about the places, but what those places mean as the kingdom of God is revealed for us. So grab your coffee and your, your goodies to eat and come on in the sanctuary as we'll continue uh, on uh, study 718, I believe it is, right? Study 7.18. 7 um, in your, on your worksheets, it's around page 155 and 156 that we're going to be picking up today. So... Uh, let's begin there. But let's start with prayer, shall we, as we come together as God's people. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing that's ours in Christ Jesus to be members of your kingdom, to be given the business of your mission, and, and to be about that every day, Father, is a great joy in our lives. Find us faithful, use us well, and use us, Lord, to connect people to Jesus in the conversations, the witness that we bear. You are great and, won and wonderful are your ways as you lead us now, as uh, we engage in Bible study, this place of faith, and see how you've used your people to get the word out, like Joseph of Arimathea. In your name we praise you and we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so what about this rich man from Arimathea named Joseph? This is who we're, we're tackling today, con continuing with, and his new tomb. That's what we're uh, investigating in this particular Bible study. And we had talked about uh, and we're, we're underneath the place of faith. So out of the three sections, the place in geography, the place today, and the place of faith, that's where we are, uh, we're going to be picking up here with uh, 
these disciples of Jesus that went out to the various parts of the world that help us make sense of maybe a little bit about some of the things we talked last week concerning Joseph of Arimathea. For instance, there's no biblical evidence, but there certainly are Christians who bear witness to it and historical annals that bear witness to Joseph of Arimathea having brought the gospel to the Isles of Britain, particularly to England. And so, is that true? Is it false? Well, again, from scriptures, I'm not going to, we can't say because it's not recorded. Um, but neither are many of the, uh, the journeys of the other apostles. Those aren't recorded in scripture either. But Christians and history bears witness to them. So, uh, while Joseph isn't called an, uh, an apostle, he is referred to as a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And we can take uh, maybe some, some notes from the apostles who uh, were given the commission of Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations as to their lives and, and their, their, their testimony in reflection of, 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 uh, of Joseph of Arimathea. So what I've given you in your worksheet now is the listing of those apostles who went out. And we're going to talk about their origin, their mission, their history, and their death. Because all of those uh, can, be, can be accounted for either through historical documents or the witness of Christians that we, we bear witness as true, so why not also then, and we have to weigh this, Joseph of Arimathea and the historical documents, the uh, legends, the, the witness of Christians as to his, as to his uh, witness. All right, let's start with Andrew, all right? The origin of Andrew, he was a fisherman from Galilee. He came from the town of Bethsaida and was Peter's brother and was in fact the one who introduced Peter to Jesus after being one of John the Baptist's disciples. So Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist, was introduced to Jesus, went to his brother Peter and said, hey, we found the Messiah, and introduced Peter to, to Jesus. They came from, they were fishermen from Galilee. His mission uh, is often called the Apostle to the Greeks. This is Andrew. He went to the land of the man-eaters, so to speak, quote, unquote and what is now called the Soviet Union, or particularly around the people called the Scythians, or modern-day Georgia, that country. He also went to the Thracians, which is the modern-day Bulgaria, where Christians there claim him as the first to bring the gospel to their land. This is the Andrew going to uh, today what we know as the Baltic area. The Scots also claim he preached to the Picts, Hence the use of St. Andrew's cross in their flag. So Andrew apparently traveled a lot up north to the Baltic area, Bulgaria, and modern-day Georgia, and then west to Scotland. And, of course, that's where the Scots claim St. Andrew as one of their patrons. Okay? Um, I've included, included for you here a map. It's not totally complete because Scotland's not on there. But you can see where some of the, uh, the names listed for the, the apostles where history and or the accounts uh, speak to that. According to, this is under history now, according to the, histor the historian Hippolytus, quote, Andrew preached to the Scythians and the Thracians and was suspended on an olive tree at Pe Patre, a town of Achaia in Greece, and there too he was buried. That's according to the historian Hippo Hippo Hippolytus. So his death then is one of martyrdom by crucifixion, we, we, we believe, in the shape of an X, not cross-shaped, but X-shaped, perhaps around 60 or 70 A.D. Tradition states that for Andrew, quote, after being whipped severely by seven soldiers, they tied his body to the cross with cords to prolong his agony. His followers reported that when he was led toward the cross, Andrew saluted it in these words, Quote, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. Unquote. He continued to preach to his tormentors for two days on the cross until he died. So the story goes. All right? Died a martyr. That's Andrew. How about Bartholomew? Bartholomew was also named Nathaniel, depending on the, uh, the, the, the gospel writer. He came from Cana in Galilee, the place of Jesus' first miracle. 
His mission is that he had widespread missionary travels attributed to him by tradition. That is, to India with Thomas, back to Armenia, and also to Ethiopia and southern Arabia. So again, these guys got around. And with transportation not like it is today, they spent a lot of time on the road, so to speak. History. Again, according to the historian Hippolytus, Bartholomew preached in India, to whom he also gave the gospel, uh, according to Matthew, and was crucified with his head downward, and was buried in Alanum, a town in Armenia that is modern-day southern Georgia. Revered by the Armenian church as the apostle to the Armenians, Eusebius in his church history confirms that the ministry of Bartholomew uh, took place, particularly India. That's, that's where um, uh, Eusebius says uh, India, but the Armenians re record him as their, their um, gospel bringer. Death. Uh, there are various accounts of how uh, Nathaniel Bartholomew met his death as a martyr for the gospel. Some suggest he was crucified with his head downward. That's the, hip the historian Hippolytus that I just uh, quoted. Others, that he was flayed alive by a whip at Alanum with an unknown date. Either way, he died a horrific death as a martyr of Jesus. Let us see. Then there's John, son of Alphaeus, or also known as James the Less or James the Younger. The origin of James. He was the son of Alphaeus. That's possibly Matthew's brother. Don't know that for sure, but doing some family tracing could be. He's one of the least three James, well I should say, one of at least three James referred to in the New Testament. He's often confused with James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the epistle, the book of James, and was the bishop of Jerusalem. He's called James the Just. That's Jesus' brother who came to know Jesus as Savior, it seems, after Jesus was resurrected. He's also confused with James, the brother of John, uh, uh, the sons of thunder. So he's one of three, okay? His mission was to Jerusalem and Syria, it seems. And again, the historian Hippolytus identifies that James was stoned to death in Jerusalem, saying... And James, the son of Alphaeus, when preaching in Jerusalem, was stoned to death by the Jews and was buried there beside the temple. So that's what Hippolytus says. Josephus, another historian, reports that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. So if the stoning wasn't enough, he got clubbed to death. He was martyred. He was arrested by the Jews, thrown off the temple, and then beaten to death by a club. The date unknown. These are all things that are recorded but um, are, are, are spoken about uh, again. Depending on the, the source, Hippolytus and Josephus are the same in their, in their understanding of his death. Some say he was thrown off the temple. Okay, he died a martyr. Letter D. Here we have another James. This is James, son of Zebedee, uh, or James the Great, or J James the Elder, uh, because of, of his place in, in the being apostle. Origin. He was the son of Zebedee, brother to John, from Capernaum referred to Jesus by one of, one of the sons of thunder, uh, and they were fishermen. His mission was primarily Judea, but some claim he was also the first bishop in Spain. But we don't know that for sure, although they would claim it. In, in the history report, reports, we hear that the first apostle, that, that James the Great, James the Elder, John's brother, was the first apostle to be martyred. Luke records in the book of Acts chapter 12, Verse 1, starting there, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And the, his death is confirmed also by the historian Hippolytus, saying, James, his brother, when preaching in Judea, was cut off with the sword by Herod the Tetrarch and was buried there. The, histor the church father and historian Eusebius describes more precisely what was cut off, uh, what was cut off James what was cut off of, of James. First, Stephen was stoned to death by them. After him, James, the son of Zebedee, and the brother of John, beheaded. So that's how they were supposedly killed. Hope this isn't too dull and boring for you, but it gives us, again, clarity as to, as to these first missionaries of the gospel, their lives, where they went, how the, how the word got spread, and helps frame Joseph for us. Um, all right, let's go on to John, 
the brother of James and the son of Zebedee. This is uh, John who wrote the gospel, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. He also came from Capernaum, was one of the sons of thunder. He self-identifies in his gospel as, quote, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Instead of saying his name, that's how he identifies himself. Um, again, he wrote the, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, in Asia, while banished by Domitian, the emperor, to the Isle of Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelation. So he, he's, um, besides Paul, he is the uh, most prolific writer in the New Testament, and of the apostles, the one who was inspired to write the most. John's mission was to Jerusalem, and then to Ephesus, where he took care of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the history account of John's life from Eusebius discusses the reason that John wrote his gospel, saying, Matthew and John have left us written memorials, and they, tradition says, were led to write only under the pressure of necessity. And when Mark and Luke had already published their gospels, they say that John, who had employed all his time in proclaiming the gospel orally, finally proceeded to write for the following reason. The three Gospels, already mentioned, having come into the hands of all and into his own two, they say that he accepted them and bore witness to their full truthfulness and that there was lacking in them an account of the deeds done by Christ at the beginning of his ministry. So according to Hippolytus, he says, John, again in Asia, was banished by Domitian, the king to the Isle of Patmos, in which he wrote his gospel and saw the ap ap apocalyptic vision, Revelation. In Trajan's time, he fell asleep at Eus in Ephesus, where his remains were sought for but could not be found. An early Latin tradition has him escaping unhurt after being cast into boiling oil. I don't know how you would escape after being cast into boiling oil, but so tradition has it. Okay? A little bit about John. It's said that he died in Ephesus of old age around 100 A.D., and it's thought that he's the only apostle to die of a natural death. All the others were, were martyred. Okay, questions, things you want to ask about or back up with? I didn't, maybe I went too fast. Matthew, also called Levi. He is a tax collector, and Jesus brought him into his discipleship in Capernaum. Matthew is the son of Alphaeus. That's possibly... James, son of Alphaeus' brother, also known as Levi or the publican, he wrote the Gospel of Matthew, this man. His mission, it seems, was to Parthia, that is Iran, and Ethiopia. In the history, Eusebius references uh, Bishop Papias of Heropolis as early as 110 A.D., bearing witness to Matthew's authorship of his gospel, saying, Matthew put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language, and each one of them interpreted as best he could. According to Hippolytus, quote, Matthew wrote the gospel in Hebrew and published it at Jerusalem and fell asleep at Heres, a town of Parthia. Parthia is near modern-day Tehran in Iran. His death... Some of the oldest reports say that he was not martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia at a date unknown. So not, not much known about his death, it seems, from history. Okay, then there's Peter, or we call him Simon. We know him as Simon Peter. Origen, fisherman from Galilee, Bethsaida, lived in Capernaum, who was previously called Simon and was also called Cephas. He was Andrew's brother, and Peter wrote 1st and 2nd Peter, that we know because of his authorship. Papias, the 2nd century Christian, recorded that Mark served as Peter's scribe and wrote the Gospel of Mark on Peter's testimony. Tradition tells the story of how they brought the bones of Mark to Venice in a pork barrel so the Muslims would not touch it. Interestingly enough, trying to venerate Mark's bones there. All right. Mission. It is traditionally believed that Peter first traveled to Antioch and established a community there as he is attributed with being the first bishop of Antioch. This is where people were first called Christians, right? He also then went to Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Batania, Italy, and Asia. According to the history, 
Again, the church father Eusebius, who quotes the pious of Herodopolis in 110 AD, records a tradition that the Gospel of Mark preserved the Gospel as preached by Peter. Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatever he experienced while he accompanied Peter. And again, we attribute all this to the Spirit and the inspiration of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, using this so that we could get the gospel message in uh, written form, even for us today. Now, Irenaeus, the church father in 180 AD, records a similar tradition and mentions that Peter and Paul founded the church in Rome, saying, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome and laying the foundations of the church. After their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down in writing what, he had, what had been preached by Peter. Eusebius records that Peter was put to death under Nero in Rome, saying, It is recorded that Paul was beheaded in Rome itself and that Peter likewise was crucified under Nero. This account of Peter and Paul is substantiated by the fact that their names are preserved in the cemeteries of that place, even to the present day, or the catacombs. Paul was a Roman citizen and could not be crucified, but got an easier death sentence, other than crucifixion. Hippolytus confirmed the fact that Peter was crucified by Nero in Rome, saying, Peter preached the gospel in Pontus, that is Turkey, Galatia, again Turkey, Cappadocia, Turkey, and Batania, and Italy, and Asia, and was afterwards crucified by Nero in Rome with his head downward, as he had himself desired to suffer in that manner. He asked for it, in other words. So martyred in Rome under Nero around 66 AD, he, was asked, he, asked him, he himself asked to be crucified upside down, since he was not worthy to die in the same manner of his Lord, or so we think. Philip. Philip comes from Bethsaida. His mission, possibly he had a powerful ministry in Carthage, that's North Africa, and then in Asia Minor, also in Phrygia, that's Turkey, and he seemed, it seems that he lived in Scythia, that's the Ukraine today, where he apparently converted the wife of a Roman proconsul. In retaliation, the proconsul had Philip arrested and cruelly put to death around 80 AD. So we think. History records, according to Hippolytus, that Philip preached and was executed in what today is eastern Turkey, saying, Philip preached in Phrygia, was crucified in Heriopolis with his head downward in the time of Domitian, and was buried there. So it seems that he was crucified on a tall cross at Heriopolis of Phrygia around 80 AD, as history relates. When Jesus said, to follow me, you're going to leave behind home and family and life and comforts and walk in my way. He was meaning it, wasn't he? These guys, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of our place in the kingdom so that we might know Jesus, had a hard life. Tough, some tough sledding. Faithful to the end. Lord, let it be for us too. Simon the Zealot. He came from Cana was called Simon the Canaanite, or Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were Jewish revolutionaries who opposed Rome. It seems that his mission was to Jerusalem, perhaps Persia. He's often depicted with Thaddeus and believed, and it's believed that they preached together. They were a team. According to history, Hippolytus says that Simon the Zealot was the second bishop of Jerusalem following James, the brother of Jesus, saying, Simon the Zealot, the son of Clopas, who is also called Jude, became bishop of Jerusalem after James the Just. He died in his sleep and was buried there at the age of 120 years. Tradition concerning his death tells us he was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god while in Persia. However, others say that he was martyred in Beirut the same year as Thaddeus in 65 AD. But again, Hippolytus says that he died in his sleep. So, different accounts. Not real sure how exactly he died. 
Then there's Thaddeus, or Judas, son of James, also known as Jude. The origin. He may have taken the name Thaddeus, meaning warm-hearted, because of the infamy that came to be attached to the name Judas, also called Labaius, not to be confused with the author of the book of Jude, who was Jesus and James' brother. His mission, it seems, was to Edessa and to the surrounding Mesopotamian region of Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. Hippolytus records for us that he says he preached to the people of Edessa, that is Upper Mesopotamia, to all of Mesopotamia, the corresponding to modern-day Iraq, northeastern Syria, southeastern Turkey, southwestern Iraq, and fell asleep at Beritus, that is Lebanon, near Syria and Turkey, and was buried there. However, it's also told, said that he suffered martyrdom around 65 AD in Beirut, Lebanon. Thomas. Thomas is called Didymus, the twin. He's possibly a fisherman. He's often remembered as Doubting Thomas. We know him as that nickname. His mission, however, was to the Parthians, the Medes, the Hyrcanians, they live in, Iraq, in Iran, the Bactrians in Afghanistan, and India. The ancient Marthoma Christians there in India revere, revere him as their founder. That's in the southeastern part of India. Hippolytus records that Thomas was an active missionary and that he met his fate in India, saying, And Thomas preached to the Parthians, Medes, Persians, Hyrcanians, Bactrians, and Marginians, and was thrust through in the four members of his body with a pine spear at Kalmin, that is Chennai, the city of India, and was buried there. That's where we landed when, with Mission India. When, with, uh, when I went with Mission India, we flew out of Newark and went to Chennai, or flew to India, landed in Chennai. And the Christians in Chennai are very <laughs> eager to take fellow Christians to see Thomas's tomb and where he was buried. I really wanted to, wanted to do that, but the organization we were with really wanted us to go to their district office, and they had a reception there for us, and so we had to play the, uh, the grateful guests and so instead of being able to see Thomas's tomb, we had a reception there at their office, which is fine. It's great. And got to see their mission ministry. But he's buried there, as they say, in Chennai. He was martyred around 72 AD, supposedly with a spear thrust, thrust four times into him. In India, the Christians claim he died at the hands of a Hindu. Whether that's substantiated or not, that's their account. Matthias. After Jesus' ascension, the eleven apostles met in the upper room where they were staying and cast lots to decide between two disciples, Matthias and Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice. He was one of the 72 who followed. Remember, Jesus had, there, were, there are concentric rings as to Jesus' ministry. And we're, we're, we, we get a picture of this throughout the Gospels and in Acts. There's Jesus, the center, the bullseye. And there's his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, who spent particularly special times with him. Then there's the 12. Then there's the 72. Quite possibly those 72, or some of them, most of them were with him in the upper room uh, for the cutting of the new covenant, what we call the Lord's Supper, on what we call Monday, Thursday. And then there's, then there's the 120. And those 120 are, are, are a group of people who would come and go throughout the three years of Jesus' ministry. But post-resurrection, post-ascension, those 120 also were part of the group that went out. Perhaps Joseph of Arimathea was part of the 120, or the 72. Justice here, for whom lots were cast to see if he would take the place of Judas, was one of those 72. Matthias, then, for whom lots was cast, his, in the casting of lots, Matthias was chosen then to take the place of Judas, Iscariot, as an, as an apostle. Justice would become one of the early church fathers, uh, 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 as history would record. The mission of Matthias. Tradition sends him to Syria with Andrew. Tradition says he founded a church in Cappadocia and ministered to the Christians on the coasts of the Caspian Sea. In Acts chapter 1, 21 to 26, it records that Matthias replaced Judas Iscariot to bring the apostles' number back to 12. So this is the same person we're talking about here. 
And some traditions say that he was martyred by burning. Others say that he was beheaded at the hands of the pagans in Colochus with a date unknown. Various accounts of Matthias' death. Paul, we're getting to the end here. Paul, the origin. Paul was from Tarsus. He was born to a Jewish mother and a Roman father, giving him dual status. He was not one of the twelve, but was nonetheless considered an apostle because he witnessed the risen Christ. As he spent time in the desert, Jesus uh, spoke to him, appeared to him, and trained him in the ways of the Christian faith, of which then Paul would become an apostle for the Lord. In his first missionary journey, Paul traveled to Antioch, Laodicea, Cyprus, Perga, and Pisidian Antioch. In his second missionary journey, he traveled, to, he traveled widely through Asia Minor and Greece. High points include Jerusalem, Tiberias, Caesarea Philippi, Damascus, Antioch, Tarsus, Pisidian Antioch, Troas, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Piraeus, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, Miletus, Sinaitis, and Rhodus. In his third missionary journey, he visits Antioch, Tarsus, Pisidian Antioch, Laodicea, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Adra, Adra, Adramitium, not one we often hear of, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Thebes, Athens, and Corinth. He also visits Crete and Sicily on his final journey to Rome. Paul got around. And we know that because of those three missionary journeys that are recorded in the book of Acts. History. Eusebius, Eusebius writes, Paul defended himself before Nero in Rome, referring to his imprisonment, that's recorded in Acts 28, was released, and he returned to the same city only to be martyred. He was so concerned about the, Rome, uh, the, the Christians there in Rome that even though he was released and he was in danger of his life, like his journeys, he visited the various places where the Christian church had been established. He was so concerned about their well-being in the gospel and he was willing to go back there and even face, face death. He was martyred in Rome around 66 AD during the persecution under Nero by beheading. And he had that way of death because he was a Roman citizen. Quick, hopefully. Now there are others, too, a few others. There's Mark, who died in Alexandria, Egypt, after being dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. There's Luke who was hanged in Greece as a result of his tremendous preaching to the lost. And there was Jude, who was killed with arrows when he refused to deny his faith in Jesus. The apostles, whether the 12, the 72 uh, uh, witnesses of Jesus, the 120, many of them died horrific deaths because of the name of Jesus. And many brothers and sisters today also are dying horrific deaths because of the name of Jesus. They will not give up that name and their faith. People in China, North Korea, India, places where there's great persecution, the Middle East, they're standing strong in the faith, as we do too. All right, so these accounts, some of them are legends, some of them are stories, some of them are written by church fathers as history, all bear fact to the gospel going out from Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Joseph of Arimathea could very well have fit into this as he went back on a familiar route where he knew to get ore for tin, or tin to make ore, or, yeah, in his tin, in his tin, as a tin merchant, to go back to Britain. He knew those people there, he had done business there, and now he goes to bear the message of the gospel of Jesus. Maybe it's not so legendary, maybe it's... Or maybe it's not just a legend. Maybe it's, there's some truth to that that we can say. Say, thanks, God. Yeah. Bringing the truth to England. Uh, comments, questions, things you want to ask about. I did a lot of talking. Let me take a drink here. Catch my breath. <laughs> Anything you want to ask about? Okay. Let's go on. So here's Joseph of Arimathea, as we're talking about it, in relationship with the other apostles and disciples. This man that... that uh, was of, of the Savior and couldn't wait to, it, it seems, tell about the resurrection of Jesus. We know that he, was, uh, he took Jesus, and um, this is number two, under the places of faith, to his own new tomb. Now let's talk about that a little bit. Just a few simple words of description, it seems, 
But what is described is as significant as is what is not described. So silence also speaks. Number letter A. We already know that Joseph is wealthy and that he comes from Arimathea. Letter B. Yet, as Matthew introduces him abruptly, there are aspects of Joseph that we can only speculate about. Like, how did he become one of Jesus' disciples? We knew he was a part of the Sanhedrin. Was it through Nicodemus? Or did he hear Jesus preach and teach himself? How do we know? How he had access to Pontius Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. I mean, not, not, not everybody had access to Pilate. How was it that he was able to have such easy access and get, the Jesus, get Jesus' body so quickly? How did Joseph know anything about preparing a body for burial? There were strict laws, according to Jewish, Jewish law, for burying the dead. How did he know about all that? After sealing Jesus in the tomb, he walks away, it seems. Then what? We hear, we, we hear nothing more of Joseph of Arimathea in, in, in the scriptures. Is that it? Well, people in England will say otherwise. Uh, yeah, he came here and preached the gospel. Okay. What is Matthew not saying? Let her see. Well, he doesn't mention that Jesus' mother or brothers and sisters, which are mentioned, as Matthew mentions in chapter 13, verses 55 to 56, Ma uh, Matthew uh, doesn't record that they were there at, at all, witnessing any of these things of Joseph or Arimathea. And we should not assume that they were there. It would be easy to, because after all, we can think to ourselves, well, well I'd, I'd be there if one of my relatives died and was on a cross and needed to be buried. I'd do that, wouldn't I? I don't know. Would you? For fear of your life? I don't know. He doesn't tell us that Jesus' inner circle of disciples was there. And we know that they were not. They were scattered, living, living behind locked doors, right? The account is spare. Yet, a great and courageous act of love and respect is acted out amidst the background of this hopelessness. Their Savior is dead. Now, what do we do? The stone is in front of the grave. What do we do with our lives? Letter D. So, what do we go away with as we join in the walk with Joseph away from the sealed tomb, a dead teacher, and aching hearts wrestling with hopelessness. Number one, this is humanity's walk. This is, this is our walk as human beings. Romans 12, 12. Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all people, including Jesus who was people. God, divine, certainly, but he was people. Death came to him, too. This is humanity's walk. Joseph gives us insights into greater truths that we're marking rather than just a man from Arimathea and one who buried Jesus in his own new tomb. He gives us insights into, into us, uh, in our human, human plight. Number two. This has been the walk of humanity since the first walk away from a guarded entrance with broken hearts. Genesis 3, 23. So the Lord God banished Adam from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Verse 24. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is not an unfamiliar walk. Joseph of Arimathea, as we walk a similar walk in these days of our humanity, Adam and Eve knew what it was like to be walking away from some place that was shut to them to, uh, from, a, from a place that they had so thoroughly enjoyed. They walked away in hopelessness. Uh, they walked away in despair. And an angel with a flaming sword guarded so they couldn't get back in. It was sealed. Number three, yet the promise given to these two from the Lord God is this. I will put enmity between you, that is the crafty tempter of verse one, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, you will strike his heel. The first promise of hope, 
the first promise of something to come, Genesis 3.15. And that, would, that promise would one day be fulfilled. For Paul records it this way, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, locked out, sealed from the kingdom, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5.6. So, letter number four. The promise that they received is the promise then that we receive. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Romans 5, 8. If... If Joseph of Arimathea, if Peter, James, John, the rest of the disciples knew that truth, do you think they'd be living behind locked doors? Do you think Joseph would have left the tomb? I know this truth, and so do you. I think I'd like to sit by the tomb and wait for, the, for that stone to be rolled away. <laughs> but we have the blessing of hindsight to, to know all of this. They were living it in the moment. While we're living in the moment... Our walk of humanity, we know this hope and this truth. So why do we live in such despair and hopelessness and worry? Adam and Eve were driven from the garden in order to be protected from eating the tree of life and living in sin forever. We are compelled to walk away from the sealed tomb, driven away. So that the Lord God Almighty might work for us his promised salvation. The last step in the humiliation of his son, so that we might be redeemed in him, is Jesus' burial in Joseph of Arimathea's new tomb. Remember that from confirmation? The steps of Jesus' humiliation and the steps of his exaltation. The last step of his humiliation is Buried in the tomb. The first step of his exaltation is he went to hell. To proclaim that victory that Jesus was risen from the dead and then came out of the tomb. Remember that? Yeah? Okay. So this is the last step of his humiliation, being buried. Verse 6 of uh, Philippians 2. Who, this Jesus, being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, buried in a tomb, to which we confess, conceived by the Holy Spirit, first step of, of humiliation, born of the Virgin Mary, second step, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, third step, was crucified, fourth, fifth step, died, last step, was buried. Apostles' Creed, the second article. So this is Jesus, having left the throne of glory, the kingdom of his Father, coming down into our humanity, now buried in a tomb. Number five, being driven away is of the Lord, who works on our behalf, far removed from our presence, we who are in hiding, we who are gripped in fear and despair, we who are hopeless outside of the gospel, yet it is with the stone in place that the exaltation of our Lord and Savior begins. Again, from 1 Peter 3. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to the Lord God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when the Lord God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And in this water, symbolizes baptism, that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but a pledge of a clear conscience toward the Lord God. It was sometime after Joseph rolled the stone in front of the tomb, walked away, that in there, before the stone was rolled away and Jesus came out, that Jesus was made alive. It's easy for us to get hooked on the thought 
that as the stone was being rolled away, life was resuscitated into Jesus' body and he rose from the dead. He was already alive. Because during this time, he went down to proclaim victory to those who were imprisoned in hell. He was already alive. He was waiting there for the stone to be rolled away, I, I, I would imagine. <laughs> waiting patiently for his father to, now, now is the time, come on, let's, let's open this thing up to come out. Waiting there to proclaim the, the life that he had been given. So this descent into hell of Christ is the first step of his exaltation. Again, going back to the Apostles' Creed, second article, as we confess, he descended into hell. First step of exaltation. On the third day, rose again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That first step of exaltation is his life in the tomb still, but he was alive as he went to hell. Number, number six, the seal of the tomb is broken. The resurrected Christ comes forth in new life, and we who are sealed in his life through the washing and baptism, which saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the Lord God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him, 1 Peter 3, we are invited back into his presence through his work of reconciliation. Again, from Romans 5, we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation, a bringing back together. Therefore, since we've been justified, by, uh, been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because the Lord God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I'm simply letting scripture answer and move us through this progression of Jesus being buried in the tomb, stone sealed, Jesus being resuscitated, raised to life, and now the stone rolled away and Jesus coming out. Let the scriptures speak to your heart about this. Let the word of the, uh, word of the Lord define what this means for us as, as God's people. So, number seven, we are brought back, uh, even though, from Colossians 1, once you were alienated from the Lord God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That whole work and act of reconciliation, bringing back together. Number eight. So, the way open for us is through the completed work of Jesus who conquers death. Now, the burial stone is rolled away. And the completed work of Jesus for our reconcilia reconciliation is made known through our lives lived in his presence. Again, Colossians. Continue in your faith. Established, firm. Do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, had become a servant. You put your name in there. And of which I, you put your name, had become a servant. It defines our living. So he brings us now into his exalted presence, number nine. Again, from the word of the Lord, this is from Philippians 2. Therefore, the Lord exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue, can out, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This is our saving God, who welcomes us into his embrace of faith by his grace to his eternal presence. This is why this is all done. This is why... A man named Joseph of Arimathea was moved to take Jesus' body off the cross, cleanse it for uh, burial, and bury, it, bury him in his own new tomb. It's all part of the Father's plan, the plan of, of our reconciliation, of, of saving faith. Number 10, as we end this study, from Martin Luther in the large catechism, 
underneath the Apostles' Creed, Article 2. This is Martin Luther writing to pastors so that they could preach and proclaim the word of God to their congregation. The small catechism was written to parents, large catechism written primarily for pastors. So this is a pastor, professor, reformer saying to other pastors, let this then be the sum of this article that the little word Lord signifies simply as much as Redeemer, i.e., he who has brought us from Satan to God, from death to life, from sin to righteousness, and who preserves us in the same. But all the points which follow in order in this article serve no other end than to explain and express this redemption. How and whereby it was accomplished. That is, how much it cost him and what he spent and risked that he might win us and bring us under his dominion, namely, that he became man, conceived and born without any stain of sin, of the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary, and that he might overcome sin. Moreover, that he suffered, died, and was buried, and, and that he might make satisfaction for me and pay what I owe, not with silver or gold, but with his own precious blood. And all this in order to become my Lord. For he did none of these for himself, nor had he any need of it. And after that, he rose again from the dead, swallowed up and devoured death, and finally ascended into heaven and assumed the government at the Father's right hand, so that the devil and all powers must be subject to him and lie at his feet, until finally, at the last day, he will completely part and separate us from the wicked world, the devil, sin, and death, etc. And we would say, Amen. Thanks be to God. <laughs> yeah. Did you get all that from Joseph of Arimathea? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's what the, the account holds for us, right? This account of God's working through a man named Joseph. All right. This new tomb, we will come next week to, to uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, where the stone is rolled away. And what that means, we're going to focus on the tomb, but the stone that the angel is sitting on, and what that means for us then as we tackle study 8.1. We're coming into the resurrection of Jesus and, and the events, the places that we'll visit uh, post-resurrection until he ascends into heaven. we got about seven more studies uh, to do in this whole study. We've got about uh, seven or eight in, in session, chapter eight, so to speak. So what, I, what I'm well, putting before you is be thinking about what you'd like to study next, what, you, what would you like to tackle next in the, in the word of the Lord. Um, uh, this has been a, a, an exciting study for me because I've got to visit these places with you in ways that I haven't visited before in my walk, journey of faith, and, and that the kingdom of God is revealed to us in these ways. What would you like to study next and tackle? So be thinking about that. Let me know, and we'll uh, and you let me know online as well, and and we'll make preparations then over the next few weeks. Okay? Questions, comments, things you want to ask about? Yeah, Keith, please. Just uh, one thought. Uh, you mentioned, you know, why was it not Joseph of Arimathea, not waited outside the tomb for the Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, there were instructions to keep people away. We we don't know that they were given instruction to keep people away. We know that they were given instructions to not let people in. Now, if I were a guard and somebody was coming towards me, I would assume that they're wanting to come in so that I would keep them away. You know, it may, we're not told specifically to keep them away, but not to let them in. So, you, who knows how vigorous their guarding was. Yeah, maybe they were, maybe one guard was more passive, passive and one was more aggressive. Who knows? But, uh, yeah. Um, they were, they were guarding the tomb, not to let anybody in to steal Jesus' body. No. Yeah, so there would have been guards there that would have kept, kept us away, possibly, that fear. Yeah, Yeah, Gary? Two things. How many brothers and sisters did Jesus have? And um, it's interesting that it was such a big deal that, that Jesus was crucified and they killed him.
But yeah, yeah. Um, let's get to the first one there. What, what, what did I reference? Matthew thir- 13. I'm trying to find the, the, the verses particularly. Um, somebody in their Bible turned to Matthew 13. Oh, where is it? Come on. It's in the first part of our study. Let's see. Here's uh, Andrew Bartholomew. I relate that to you. Matthew, it's Matthew 13. Like the cross that they swear that Jesus was was probably not there. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, Jesus is, is, um, uh, I can't remember where he is. If you find that in Matthew 13, let me know. But they're saying, Jesus, your brothers and sisters are outside waiting for you. So the plural is used of both men and women who are related as brothers and sisters to Jesus. Later on in the accounts of the Scriptures is when we get their names. James, the brother of Jesus, who was the bishop of um, uh, of, uh, of Jerusalem, um, etc. And so uh, jo- Joseph, being maybe one of them too, who was called Jude. Uh, there's there's other others that are named throughout the script, throughout the New Testament writings. We don't we're not told how many he had though, but we know that he had more than one, right. several. That's right. Yeah. Now this is a diversion. And this is an area where uh, the Reformation, uh, through Luther and the Reformers, took note. And this is where the Roman Catholic Church says, no, uh, Jesus didn't have any brothers and sisters because Mary had to be pure and holy her whole life. Where scripture clearly says, no, he had brothers and sisters. Yeah, you got it, Sue? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> So it names at least four brothers there, unnamed sisters. He, he had multiple siblings, it seems. Again, that was the point of the Reformation that Luther and the others said, no, no. Mary was a normal woman who could bear children, and she did. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, oh, the second one. What was the second one you asked? The fact that he wasn't seized a second time. Yeah. So the fact that he wasn't seized a second time... Um, off the top of my head, this is how I would answer, uh, theologically, I guess, uh, would say. One is the resurrection of Jesus is the hinge of our Christian faith. And because it's the hinge of our Christian faith, whether you see him resurrected or not, which is this discussion with Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and believed, uh, is, is the activity of faith. So... Those who wanted Jesus dead, in their estimation, he was dead. And uh, then they, they could not believe, because they didn't have faith, that he was resurrected. So they had no more purpose to pursue him because they didn't believe that he was resurrected. Secondly, Jesus, in his glorified state following the resurrection, could be someplace, it seems, and... He, he, had, he had attributes that he could eat and be seen and touched, but yet he could pass through walls. Or he could go from here to there without um, walking, transporting. However, our English has a hard time describing that. There were, there were divine qualities about his glorified state that we, we know nothing about yet. We'll experience one day. And so even if they tried to capture Jesus, they wouldn't have been able to. Ropes, you know, chains... Net would not have been able to hold him because he, he had a glorified state. Yeah. So those are the two ways that come to mind quickly. Yeah. Thanks. From the post resurrection, the question is did, did only believers see Jesus uh, after he ra- was raised from the dead? Um, I think so. I believe so. From the gospel accounts, he appeared to his disciples. Acts records that he appeared to the 120. He appeared to Mary, 
Magdalene and the garden post-resurrection. I think he only appeared to two believers. Yeah. Of 500, that's right, in the book of Acts, yeah. I believe he only appeared to believers. Again, this is the hinge of faith, right? Only disciples of Jesus, those who believe him to be Redeemer, Savior, Lord, Mashiach, are going to recognize him as the resurrected one. Unbelievers are going to claim it's a ghost, it's a, it's a, a second body double, uh, whatever. He didn't really die. You know, all, those, all those accounts that would try to in history that have tried to refute, refute the resurrection would have that, those excuses. Yeah. But didn't he, I, I mean, at the tomb, I mean, I, I guess I wonder if to unbelievers or he was even recognizable because at the tomb they thought he was a gardener. These are people who knew him intimately. At first, that's right. And then on Emmaus, they, he revealed himself to them. So, you know, it could It be wasn't like, oh, that's Jesus. He, yeah. had, to, he had to reveal himself yeah. as this glorified risen Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a, again, that's faith, right? Faith <laughs> believes as it's revealed. Unbelief would say, no, that's not Jesus. I don't want to, or, you know, I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Hope this didn't bore you today with studying where the disciples went, but it, it gives context into Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, and think about Mary Magdalene. Uh, and, and, and do some self-study with that. Where did Mary Magdalene go post-resurrection? Um, she, had a, she certainly had an account to tell, being freed of seven demons uh, and, and having witnessed the resurrected Lord. Anyway, those, those other disciples, besides just the 12, people who knew Jesus and had the gospel, where'd they go? What'd they do? What about you? You have the gospel. What about me? That's our life, too. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. For time in your word today, for the study that brings us into a deeper relationship in your kingdom with Jesus. As we um, go forward now, just use us mightily, powerfully, Lord, for your praise and glory. Thank you for this morning's worship, and we can't wait to be, to be together again. Whether that's next Sunday, or if you choose to come, uh, send your son, Heavenly Father, and Jesus comes, we'll say welcome, Lord. Bring us home. In your name we praise, we pray to you, and we go in your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, friends. Basically, you're welcome. Basics and beginnings will we'll start here in just a few minutes. If any of you want to stay, please feel free. We're going to embrace our history today. So if you want to know more about our history uh, as a congregation, please feel free to stay.